Yeah. Well, good morning. Now I feel like I have to stretch. I'm watching you stretch. You gotta do your stretches. I'm doing my yeah. stretches. Does a cheetah stretch before he takes down a zebra? No. It doesn't. No stretching involved. <laughs> Amen. What? <Same. laughs> People say I'm random. That's pretty random. <laughs> oh, stick around. Welcome to the rock. Where do you get your information? We don't stretch. <laughs> no zebras were hurt in the stretching this morning. <laughs> it's all good. We're a little weird around here, and it's fun. <laughs> Welcome to The Rock. We're excited to have you guys here this morning. I hope you are as excited to be here as we are. It's great. It's great. God, we love you so, so much. God, we know that you have a sense of humor because you created us in your image. And we are sometimes just odd and weird and funny, and it's so much fun. God, thank you so, so much for bringing in more oddballs that we all just have fun and we, you know, we praise you and we sing and we're not afraid to be, God, who you made us to be but to go out and to show the world love and your light. And God, we thank you so much for that. God, as we go throughout the service, make our ears tune into your station. Let our eyes be opened. God, if you need to tear off some veils this morning, let's do it. And it's gonna be fun and it's going to be life-changing. It may hurt, but God, that's just part of the process. And when you heal, Holy Spirit, you heal us up better than what we were before. And we thank you for that. Amen. If you guys want to stand up, we're going to get our praise on.
looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you oh this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise
our past, God, is nothing for what you want us to get into, into your kingdom. God, let the things that Satan has put on our shackles, has shackled us to, on our hands and our feet. God, today is the day that we're going to break those away. Today is the day we're going to prepare the way for you today. Come on. Sing this with us. Prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, come on, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way. Sometimes when you are fighting the enemy, and it's not people we're fighting against, it's darkness, it's all a spiritual battle now. We're not back in the biblical times when, you know, the Philistines and they all fought physically each other. That's not what we're doing now. It is all a spiritual battle. And sometimes, guys, when that enemy and that darkness is telling you things in your ears, and it's getting you into things. Sometimes you need to stop and let the line of Judah roar. And you just scream back at that darkness. And it may be physical words or it may be just a physical cry and like, ah! But guys, you got to not be afraid to let it go and praise God in the process. It can get sticky. It can get loud. But, oh, the places he wants to take you is truly amazing. Oh, so good. He's so good. Sometimes you've got to dance through the darkness, sing through the fire, praise when it don't make sense. Sometimes you've got to stand the giant worship from the lion's den sometimes you've got to shout it from the mountain louder in the valley trusting that he's gonna get you there sometimes you've got to welcome the wonder wait for the answer worship with your hands in the air i'll praise you anywhere praise give him praise give him praise in the highest praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest he is worthy. Yes, he is worthy of all of your praise. Sometimes 
times you've got to praise in the prison, cry out to heaven, shout it till the door swing wide. Sometimes you've got to stand on your shackles, brave in the battle, worship with your hands held high. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give a praise, give a praise in the highest praise. Give a praise, give a praise in the highest. Everyone notice Blaze's cool yellow socks and his red sticks? Yeah. <laughs> and we have one more song to sing before we <laughs> yes, start Yes, we do. I think it's somebody's birthday, isn't it's it? It's somebody's 40th birthday 40th today. 40th birthday. Who's 40th birthday? 40th is it? birthday. Who's going to be? Oh, oh it's Mike's right 40th there. birthday. Mike's 40th birthday. Wow. How does Happy it feel to be old? Happy birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Mikey Poo. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you guys were here a few months ago, um, more than a few months now, probably, Mike proposed to Emily here on stage, and she was like super surprised and embarrassed, and she said, could you please sing happy birthday to him today so it's his turn to be super surprised and embarrassed? Yes, absolutely. We should have made him come up front, yes. huh? <laughs> <laughs> and they are getting married on Saturday, so yes. woo -hoo! We love it. We did another wedding yesterday for a we young did. couple. 
And there was also a new baby born this week. So Ashley and Nate Harper had their little baby boy. His name is Crew. Crew. C-R-E-W. Crew. So welcome, Crew Harper, to the Rock Church family. They did not want any meal. So if you have their number, send them a message and say congratulations. And hopefully we'll see them soon with their baby. Yes. And we're still waiting. So Ashley's sister, Alyssa, is also due in the next couple weeks. So another baby yep. is coming. I know. Yep. It's pretty, so it's cool. pretty cool. We're getting God's good. weddings and babies, and it's awesome. That's I remember we used to only have like one baby in the nursery. Now it's like, I don't know, we're still going to have to expand the nursery. I love babies, and I tell people it's great because I get my baby fix at church every Sunday, and then I don't even, I don't miss my grandkids as much. <laughs> not that they're babies anymore. They're not. But no, they're not babies <laughs> no more. But I love I love babies. So They're I not even baby pains baby. in the butts anymore. They're major pains in the butts. <laughs> They're kind of big, but yeah, they live they in are. North Carolina, so we don't get to see them that often. Yeah. So I have to love on everybody else's kids to make up for that, right? Absolutely. Yes. Well, welcome to the Rock Church, everybody. If you haven't met me yet, you should have. You probably did when you walked in the door, but I'm Bethany. I'm the outreach pastor here at the Rock, and this is my handsome husband, Terry. I am pretty handsome, aren't I? Yes, you Thanks. are. You are. <laughs> And if you are visiting today, if you're visiting online and you want to connect with us, I would invite you to go to our website, which is yourrock.org, and give me your name and your number and your email, and we can connect. And you can get messages from me and answer me, because I love it when people actually answer my messages. <laughs> yeah, if not, she's like depressed. They didn't answer me I yet. Am. So yesterday I sent out a text message to the whole church family, and uh, there's, um, I think, like 200 people on that list, believe it or not, because not everybody comes every Sunday, and, you know, and I only got four replies, and I was like, <laughs> I'm so sad. Only four people answered me. Yeah, when she always says that, we're doing outreach, are you coming? I always put no. He does, I it's always true. reply. Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> I say, no, I'm busy. Sorry, I won't be there that day. So if you didn't get that message yesterday and you're not on our church family list, please let me know because sometimes I miss people here and there and I want to make sure that you are getting the messages if you're part of the church family. You want to be getting the messages. I mean, if you don't, that's okay too. <laughs> like I just looked like at Sarah and Nick that just moved back home. You guys need to get back on the church family list, right? Woohoo! Welcome home, by the way. I didn't get to say that last week. So. <laughs> yes, Nick spent how many years in the Marine Corps? Five. Five years Five in the Marine Corps. Five years. Five so. years in the Marine Corps, and he's back. He's back. Yes. And you guys are both <laughs> looking for jobs? Yes. So if anyone knows anywhere that's hiring, that would be a good job for these, this wonderful young couple. Talk to me after church. Okay. Terry's got a job I for keep you. Forgetting. <laughs> I wanted to reach out to you this week, and I forgot, so sorry. It's all good. God's good. Yes. Um, also, if you want to give today, you can give online. You can give in our fabulous little green boxes that are in the back. They are fabulous. They're fabulous. They're going to get bigger, hopefully. Someday. So there's more room I think more. it's called Someday Over the Rainbow or Somewhere Over the Rainbow or something like that. I hope it's not Over the Rainbow. It's Over the Rainbow. <laughs> uh, what's That's going on this week? Oh, we got all kind of cool things going on this like week. What? I don't know, outreach says today, but it's really not it's next week. It's really week. not today. Because I so missed that on my <laughs> message. Next Sunday, we are going to Kennedy Park from 2 to 4 p.m. for our summer outreach. Uh, we would love for you to join us for that. We would. We are also joining up with the Vandergrift Methodist Church. Uh, they are doing their family fun festival and this is the first time they have ever left their church property to do this family fun festival. So we are so excited, and they have talked to lots of other churches and groups in Vandergriff, and uh, they told me like six or seven different churches are participating, and that's going to also be at Kennedy Park. It's on Saturday from 11 to 3. So Tim and Becky are going to be there with the foam party and the bounce house. And if anyone else can make it, that would be awesome. Wear your Love Like Jesus t-shirt and hang out. Smile and love like Jesus and show people how much <coughs> they are loved in the Vanderrift community. And 
that's awesome. Like, I'm, I can't tell you how proud I am <laughs> of this church for getting outside of their church and yeah. going. They've done a lot of things, like, they, they are trying, but they always, you know, come in, come in, come in, instead of, oh, we should go to the people. So I'm, I'm super excited for that. Yeah, our event. goal isn't just to us to be that church. It's to get everyone to start being those kind of churches that go yes. out and touch the community because that's what God called us to do is to be a light to the world. Yeah. So, yes. Anyhow, so then we got a back-to-school drive going on, right? Woo! Absolutely, yes. And the youth group is in charge of this, but they are collecting back-to-school supplies that we are going to hand out on August 25th when we are at Kennedy Park for our very last day of outreach. And we are getting the little cinch sack backpacks printed with the Rock Youth label. And we're getting water bottles made that say, what would Jesus do to go in with all the school supplies? And then the church in Vandergriff called Until the Whole World Knows Ministry. It's a mouthful. Um, they are going to be joining us at the park also. And they're helping collect school supplies because the more we have, the more kids we can bless. Absolutely. And they're doing um, like giveaways, like gift card giveaways. They're giving away a laptop and they're doing free haircuts for all the kids also. So we'll be set up on one side with all our usual, you know, fun food, all that. And they'll have tents on the other side where they're doing some of their stuff. And then the school supplies will be like in the middle. <laughs> yeah. And they're really good at haircuts. <laughs> Just let you know. So I would recommend stopping by and get your haircut for free. You should, absolutely. Just saying. But we need a lot more school supplies because the box is only like half full. It's out there right in the lobby. It's a big, it's a big blue bin and it's only half full. So please, all the folders, so next notebooks, week, buy pencils, something. pens, glue. Yeah. Get the scissors with really pointy ends. Yeah, Just the teachers you know. love that. That's teachers like those kind of stuff. <laughs> but anyhow. Yeah, Thank super you. glue, super glue is good. Yes, that's a good thing to throw in there <laughs> for them. Yes, all those oh fun things goodness. that you played yes. with in school, you know. Mm -hmm. If you really want to make it good, get the Elmer's glue and squirt super glue into the Elmer's glue. So when they would go to paste their hands and peel it off like we did in school, it like sticks. That would be horrible. Where do you come I'm, up with these things? It just happens, honey. It's just in my brain. It just kind of happens. It's just the way my brain thinks. Gene was agreeing with me. He was into it. Brain. So yes. his brain thinks the same way as mine does. <laughs> must be because he has no hair. I don't know. It must be what it is. I don't know. Maybe when your hair falls out. No. Mine's still there. It's just not much. But anyhow. What else uh, is happening? What else is happening? So I just wanted to show you what we've been doing to Shalakta. Um, we're hoping to have Shalakta open by Thanksgiving, Christmas, somewhere in that time frame. Um, just show you what we've been doing. We have the front of the church redone. Those are new windows, and the other ones are being blocked shut. And I wanted to give a picture of the final stained glass window that went by the wayside. That was last week. And I've been sitting there toothing all the bricks, so we're going to get those bricks maybe shut this week. I don't know. We'll see how it all goes and what the weather does. And, oh, whoa, my button stuck there. We've been staining, practicing staining. We're going to stain the whole building. It's going to be gray. Because we don't like red brick buildings just because. And they're dated and we want it to There's what look it looks like now. We want it to look modern. And then the last thing we did is we started cutting out the roof in order to put in climbing areas. Yes. So we're going to be cutting up through the trusses and doing all kind of cool stuff up in there. And then after this, we're going to do the wiring and the plumbing. And then we're going to start hanging drywall and painting. And when yeah. we get into painting, when, by the way, when we stain the building we're going to be trying to get a whole bunch of people to come at once and stain it i don't think we'll make it in one day just to let you know because we found out it's really rough brick and we're going to try a sprayer and see if that works and if that works we're going to buy a bunch of little wagner sprayer thingies and let you paint each other and i would never do that but never. you never know could happen <laughs> what are you laughing at lee you may be the one painted to the wall just letting you know your outline will be there but it's all good so that's great. what we've been doing at Chalakta, and it's going to be amazing. you'll be working Wednesday and Thursday Wednesday this and week Thursday from 4 this to week. 7. Yes. yes. So. And maybe Saturday, too. It depends if I feel like going to the wedding or not. We'll see. <laughs> uh, we'll see what happens. You see should have seen show. Emily's face. Yeah, but he, Mike didn't even hear it, so he's off in la-la land, but it's all good. So really glad you're here this morning. I hope I, not I hope, I think I have a very interesting message that will touch your life this morning. Um, as I've been going through this walking by faith thing, God's really been speaking to my life and letting me look back at my life at things that, I'm just going to say it, I didn't do right, that I didn't understand who God was, how God worked, 
I didn't understand prayer the way I thought I understood prayer. I was taught a lot of things growing up as a kid, but I found out by reading the Word of God that not everything the people told me was the truth. It was their own interpretation. And the Bible tells us straight up, no scripture is of private interpretation. Just to let you know that, that it is, you know, God wants it to be public. It's not like when someone says, I got a new revelation, I would run from that person. Just to let you know. Um, but when they do get a revelation of what God's Word says, it, it should always be consistent, the same. And it's divine revelation because the Holy Spirit does not change. God does not change. And I want to take you on a journey this morning on maybe why, if you've had that time where you're like, why aren't my prayers being answered? I pray this will help point you in the direction of why your prayers aren't being answered. Because God doesn't change. And let's get started on this journey this morning. So walking by faith and not by sight. How many know sight's a lot easier to walk by than by faith? Right? If you don't believe me, get one of your kids or your wife or your husband, close your eyes and say, here, walk me out to the car. You better trust them, right? Because you never know what car you might be getting into. They blindfold you or something like that. And how many know it's scary walking by faith because you don't see the future. You don't know how it's going to work. You don't understand it. Because God is never going to be God in your life who explains every detail to you and does that in your life. He just does not do that in your life at all. Um, this week, just in my life, I was sitting there yesterday, actually, I was toothing the bricks on the on the Shalakta building, and it's really not something that's really fun to do. It's a little bit of work. It's really hot. Uh, how many knows it's really been hot? It's really been humid. I was up high on uh, scaffolding, not scaffolding, but bladder jacks and stuff like that, which, you know, they move the brick breaks, and you never know when it's going to break, and it almost feels like you're going to fall off almost every time the brick breaks, just trying to get you to understand what it's like being there. And I'd been there for about, I don't know, three, four hours doing that by myself. And I was up there doing that stuff, and uh, I was sitting there, and I was getting kind of annoyed. Some days I get annoyed. Does anyone remember, the, what was that, the annoyed who used to be in the pizza box? Who was that? I don't know. Oh, Domino's Pizza. Does anyone remember the Domino's Pizza was a little annoyed? Every once in a while he parks on my shoulder and he's a little annoyed. And he's like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing all this kind of stuff? And it was really kind of cool because I was sitting there thinking about it and it was hot and I'm sweating. I mean, I was soaked in sweat and I had a hat on and it was so drenched that I threw my hat off and I wrapped the towel around my head and it was running down into my safety glasses. And I was like, okay, I just give up. I don't even care for running through my safety glasses anymore. We'll just let it run. So I was running. And as I was there, I was starting to get annoyed, and all of a sudden, I turned my head, and I looked out in the yard, and God gave me one of those vision moments. It was really kind of cool, and I saw little kids running through the yard, and I saw like a fire pit, and there was people walking around, and, and God said, that's why you're doing it. You don't do it for the people that are here now. You do it for the people who aren't here yet, and it was like encouragement to my heart, and I want to let you know that's God's heart. God's heart is always for people who don't know him yet. The church world for years, we thought it was about us and our little congregation. And, you know, I had people, not anymore, but we used to have church dinners years ago. And some walked up to me one day, and I don't know, probably a year or two ago, and like, when are we going to do a church dinner, Pastor Terry? And I said, never. And they just kind of looked, well, I used to enjoy those so much. I said, well, those days are long gone because, you know, we can't do that anymore. It just doesn't, and we don't want to be that. We want to be a church and a people that loves people. We want to go to parks. We want to do things that will encourage people to come in and taste and see that the Lord is good, right? That's what God's all about. Not just come in, but go out where they are and tell them God's good. So as we walk by faith, I want you to understand that is God's heart. God loves people. Now, I want you to really get that. So I want to take in this journey this morning on prayer. And I want you to Start with a scripture that God gave me a few years ago when I was reading the book of Psalms and it really jumped out in my heart and really in my mind. I have Romans chapter 1 up there for a reason and this is releasing the power or the, the promises of the, of the harvest and in Romans chapter 1 says, God is clearly, Romans chapter 1 verse number 20 if you want another verse, God is clearly seen in all of creation. I love that. Uh, if you live in the country, you ought to thank God that you live in the country. Um, I've always been a country person. I lived in the city for, I don't know, 13 years, 14 years, somewhere around there when I had a business that worked with around high tech, and I was in that environment all the time of downtown Pittsburgh and all the craziness all around it, and, and it really changed me a lot because, you know, when you live in the country, you see God in everything. It's so cool. I have a, 
feeders out back. I keep buying more every time we go to the store and I go to Ollie's or something. I'm like, well, there's a bird feeder cheap. So I have all these feeders now and I've got like all different kind of bird seed that I feed and I feed the deer and I feed the squirrel and I feed the birds and I think of what else I can feed because I just enjoy watching them. And it's so cool because when you see creation, you see God. You realize that. And I realize that, you know what, if you're rural and most of us are, you need to thank God because God is clearly seen in all of creation. It was so cool. I was driving home from Shalakta the other night working on a building, and I was driving, and there's a big field on the way back roads when I come home, and it's full of um, soybean. And it's so cool because almost every time I drive there, it's almost dark. We leave at about 7.30, somewhere around there, 8 o'clock is when I leave. So when I'm coming back through, and I see all these little baby deer out there, and I see bucks out there, and their velvet man, one, and it had tines like this high on its head. I could see it's horns out over the edge, and I'm like, this is just so cool to be able to drive through and see it. I get to see the corn growing and the soybeans growing and all the cool things growing, and, and when we see that, you see God working, and you need to realize that. So in all of creation, you see, and this is what God says in Psalms. I want you to catch this, 19. He says this, in the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun. Now he's using a reference for reason and a purpose. Pitching a tent is a reference to kingness. Does everyone understand that? When this arid place of Israel, most people sit there and think it, it's, it's hot there, it's sunny there, it's, it, it's warm there. You know, you read about snow, snow only goes on Mount Hermon, it doesn't snow in Jerusalem and all those places. And a lot of the, the, the landscape of Israel is actually summer year-round around the Dead Sea and it like, always stays hot and dry down there. And so... When he talks about it, he's talking about pitching a tent for the king. Whenever a king would go, he would pitch his tent, right? That was a sign of royalty. And God says, I pitched a tent for the sun. And he goes on, he says, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. He's talking about the sun. He's talking about how the sun comes up and everyone knows it goes through the sky, right? Anyone can stop it? Nobody can stop it, right? It doesn't matter what happens on planet earth today, tomorrow that sun will rise. You all get that? I don't care if, and it's not going to happen, but if every nuclear weapon in this world was blown up on earth, guess what would happen tomorrow? The sun would rise. you got to get that. God's stating something. He's saying this is like the promises of God. He says they are consistent. They're always there. They're not going away. It's not going to pass. This is the promise. He says, look up to the sky. This is the way I work. This is how I move. I am consistent all the time. How many know that you can go to a lunar table and you can go all the way back a thousand years and find out when the sun rose and when the sun set? Did you know that? How many know that you can go a thousand or ten thousand years ahead and you still will know when the sun would rise and the sun would set? Because it's consistent and God's saying, this is the way this works. He goes on and he says this, he says, it rises at one end of the heavens and it makes its circuit to the other. That's what it does, right? Everyone knows that, right? You look at it and you say it's morning. How many know you look at it and you say, it must be almost afternoon. How many know you sit there and you say, well, we better get home because it's ready to set, right? That's a fact of life and you know that. Why do you know that it's going to get dark? Because the sun's going down. Why do you know it's going to get bright? Because the sun's going up. Why do you know it's noonday? Because it's straight above your head and it's on full power and it's hot, right? And you know that. You know that and that's what God's saying. He says, that's what my promises are like. He says, nothing is hidden from its heat. So God's saying, I am predictable. I am consistent. God says this, I am the Lord God, I change not. He says this, there is no variableness nor turning of my ways. He says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Everyone got that? What is the sun like? The same yesterday, today, and as long as it exists, it's going to do what it's designed to do. That's what God says. So when God's making that reference, he's trying to give you a point and say, this is how I work. So if your prayers aren't working, God's not the problem. Everyone get that? If my life's not working, God's not the problem. It is you not positioning yourself in the right places and being in the right places. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. So I want to take you on a journey into Psalms chapter 37 verses 3 and 4. Now this is a scripture that in my life I used wrongly for a long time in my Lack of knowledge stage, let's say. How's that sound? Everyone, 
How many, well, I'm not going to ask you. I went through a lack of knowledge stage. What was that? I believed what people told me, but until I got enough knowledge of the Word of God into my own personal life, that's why the Bible says to all of us in here, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who is worthy of his hire. You see, there's a lot of people who tell you what the Bible says, but God really tells you what the Bible says. I've heard a lot of people quote scriptures, and I remember whenever <clears throat> I was young and just start getting the ministry, and I would have to sit there, and they would quote it, and I'd go into my Strong's Concordance, because we didn't have computers back then where you could type it. Now I just Google search it, right? Or just type it into the search, and I don't even need a Bible program anymore, and I can pull it up on the program and all that kind of stuff, or off of internet and go there and type it in. That's how I build a lot of my messages. But I remember back then, people would sit there and say, this is in the Bible, and I'd look for the scripture, and I'd never find it. Or I'd find it, and it wasn't anything like they quoted it. How many know what I'm talking about? You see, when I study and I learn what God says, I now have God's word, not man's word. It doesn't do you a bit of good to sit there and say, Pastor Terry said on Sunday about the sun, and it just keeps on going. And, no, that's not what Pastor Terry said. God said something about he set a tent, and he puts it in there, and it rises from the east and goes to the west. And, and you need to know that that's there. You see, it doesn't matter what someone told you. It amazes me sometimes when I sit there and I watch on Facebook and I, I, people love to put up certain scriptures like, God will supply all your needs according to the riches and glory through Christ Jesus, right? That's one of the ones we love to sit there. God said he'll supply our needs. Well, if you're doing what God what told you to do and you're doing what God said to do, but if you're looking to just to spend money and buy a UTV or buy a new car or, you know, go on vacation, no. Uh, doesn't quite apply for that, just let you know. It's according to God, and we're going to talk about that this morning. So he says this. He says, trust in the Lord and do good. Everyone get that. What's he tell you to do? Trust and do good. What is good? Ah, we need to answer that question. Because I've heard lots of people saying, I am doing good and being good. But you know what? Someone in the Bible answered that question, and I think his name was Jesus. You believe that? Yeah. Someone looked at him and said, good teacher, and he says this. You ready for this? There is none good but God. Ah, so if I trust in the Lord and do good, I should be doing what? What God does. Everyone get that? You see, just because the world calls it good doesn't mean God calls it good, right? You know, we got broke in that. Well, uh, this is just what. It doesn't matter what society says or anyone else says. It's what God says. So I got to trust in the Lord, and let's just say this. Trust in the Lord and be like God. Everyone got that? Good. So he goes on, he says, then you will live safely in the land and prosper. That's pretty cool, but I don't want to stay in that promise. I want to go to this one. Take the light in the Lord. And this was the scripture I found. I was like, take the light in the Lord and listen to what he says. You ready for this? This is crazy. He says, and he will give you the desires of your, your heart's desires. Man, I was like, I can have the heart's desires if I delight myself in God. That means I could get a new job. That means I could have more money. I could get a new car. I could have all the toys I want, right? You know, that was what I was like, man. I was like, man, delight myself in the Lord, and I can have my desires. I, I was in the desires that God would get rid of some people in my life and, you know, all that kind of stuff. How many know that God has some of those people that you'd like God to remove there to train you? I just had to throw that out there because some of you are like, I wish God would get them out of here, and God's like, no, they're there to teach you. Yeah. You know, I learned this. I'm just going to throw this out there. I learned that God lets people hurt you and offend you in your life. You ready for this? So that you end up putting them in the priority of your prayer life to know him. Because my Bible tells me, I hate this scripture, pray for those who despitefully use you. If I was writing it, it would say, slap those who despitefully use you. Anyone else know what I'm talking about? But here God comes along and God tells me I'm supposed to pray for those who despitefully use you. And you know what? Whenever you sit there and you're seething and you're angry and you're sitting there and you're thinking about them, and you're like, man, I can't believe they did it to me. That's when you need to pray and say, God, they need to know you. And that's why I believe with all my heart God puts them in your mind so that you have to pray for them and bring them before the Father because God wanted them to know him. And one of the greatest ways he would ever get them to know you, him is by making them offend you so you never forget their name. Isn't that pretty cool? You know, when you look at life like that, life gets a whole lot better. So this year, and you're in school, and someone walks up and slaps you, God's slapping you. And he's saying, pray for them. That's what I want you to do. So if, no, don't go slapping people. Never mind. 
Some of you want to slap someone to get more prayer time. Don't do that, okay? And he said, I'll give you the desires of your heart. Well, I like that, but except what you have to do is you have to look the meaning of it, and delight is something more than that. He says, be soft or pliable. So if I take away the word delight and I says, read it and say, be soft and pliable, and God will give me the desires of my heart. How many know the whole meaning of the scripture changed? Because now I realize what God's really looking for me to be is to be like him and to be soft and pliable into God's plans. Because how many know, and you are there too, we are stubborn. Right? We want to tell God how it should be. I, I've had a lot of really good ideas I've tried to sell God on. Has anyone else ever tried to do that? You're like, man, God, if you would do blah, 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 it would be amazing, at least for me, not for you, but it would be amazing. Well, God knows our hearts, and he knows they're evil, and he actually tells us to be this. He goes on, and it says, figuratively, to be feminine or luxurious. And I, I talked about this a little bit in the earlier service, and I want to say it again. You know, women are really kind of cool and amazing whenever they fall in love with someone or they really like someone. If you walk up to them and you say, I really like your shirt, guess what shirt they're going to have on every time they see you? How many know what I'm talking about? They're like, man, I want to wear that shirt because he said I really look good in this shirt. So that's why God says the same way. That's why he says that in that context. He says to be feminine and to be luxurious because it's soft and it's pliable. And God wants you and I to be that way so that we stand there and we are being molded into the image of God. Isn't that cool? But he doesn't stop there. So let's get a little bit deeper. So one of the things that I've learned in my life, I think one of the biggest revelations that has changed my life is these two thoughts, and I'm going to share them with you this morning. Now, I made up my mind whenever God called me in the ministry, I said something, and I was talking to my mom that particular day, and I said, I'm always going to be honest, I'm always going to be real. And I mean that with all my heart. One of the things I learned in my life that was a mistake in my life was this first thought, and that was, I thought God was here to serve me. I want you to read that. I think there's a lot of people still in the church world who think God is there to serve them. I think the American church even tries to push that. Like, if you serve God, you're going to be rich and you're going to have lots of money. I want to tell you it all. That's not at all what God wants. God is not here to serve you. Shake your head and give me a Presbyterian nod so you get that. Because there's a lot of people sitting in churches that think that's what God's all about. I just wish God, I'm just praying for God to make my life better. Did it ever dawn on you that he puts you where you are so that you would love him better rather than make your life better? I want to tell you what, God's heart is for people. I want you to get that. And whenever God changes your life, you're changed. He wants you to change other people. He's not here just to bring you to know him and to let you experience salvation and start following Jesus and get filled with the Holy Spirit so you can walk around and go, God's just so good all the time. I had someone years ago that was sitting there and they were standing up and they were, it was a pastor who was at a conference and he sat there and said, my wife is just to the point where she's just got joy in everything she does and everywhere she goes. And I thought, yeah, right. Because I'm just telling you, that ain't real life. How many know that's not real life? I don't care how much you try to have joy all the time. You ain't going to have joy all the time. Now, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Don't get me wrong. And I can always have that place I can go to and remind myself, just like when I was up there working on the brick and God showed me that, I wasn't in a joyful spot. I was in a spot where I wanted to go home and say, fooey on this, I'm tired of this, I'm hot, I'm weary, I'm cranky, I'm crabby. Does anyone else get cranky and crabby when you get hot and weary? Praise God, yeah, you, I think most all of us do. And I just wanted to get out of there. I was like, okay, well, no one else here. What am I doing here? But you know what? God had to show me something and restore that joy of my, in my life. And that's what the joy of the Lord is, strength. Because God gives us revelation and reminds me. He says, wait, we're not doing this for what's here now. We're doing this for what is going to come. I'm doing this for the glory of the kingdom of God. And that's what we've got to learn about our lives. Every one of you are living the same thing. Listen, just because I, I get the privilege of having or being whatever they say, of uh, being a pastor, you sit there and say, well, your life's different. No, we're all the same. And I want to be real enough to tell you we're all the same. I'm nothing special. So this is what I got. Now I realize I am here to serve him. You see, when I made that switch in my life and realized that God was not serving me, but I was to serve him. My whole prayer life began to change. My whole walk with God began to change because I moved from being selfish to being a servant. Y'all getting this? You see, if I live in a selfish state, I don't get much from God. 
I get the crumbs from the master's table. Man, you got to get this. I grew up in the Pentecostal denomination where we'd shout ourselves happy, we'd dance, we'd speak in tongues, we'd praise the Lord, and we'd go, why well, isn't God good? And we'd walk out and we'd like, I feel like I'm drunk with wine. And I think a lot of times that's how a lot of people got, they felt like they're drunk with wine, but we never touched anyone else's life. We just couldn't wait back to get back to the party again. I'll tell you what, that's not God's heart. I just want to tell you, that's an adulterous relationship because we were worshiping and getting so caught, man, I just wish people would experience God. Well, then go tell them and let them experience God. But what we got to understand is that selfishness because God wants us, when God grabs a hold of me, my whole destiny and my whole purpose in life and yours too is to convince and to touch other people and tell them the good news of the gospel and let them see through my life that if God changed me and transformed me, God can change you. Everyone get that? So when my heart changed and I realized I am here to serve, not to be served, I then understood the heart of, you ready for this? Jesus. Yeah. Now you ever want to get spiritual, just go to Mark chapter 10 and start reading. Mark chapter 10, Garrett, is a really interesting place because it's where two of his disciples wanted to ask Jesus a really powerful question. And you know what they wanted to do? They wanted to ask to be sat on the right hand and the left hand of Jesus when he came into the kingdom because they were convinced he was the king and they figured, Josiah, it was time to get our position sealed. So they walked up to Jesus and, they, and then the other disciples heard him and started talking and saying, who do they think they are? Because I was hoping to get to the right hand of Jesus and the left hand of Jesus. And how many know there's 12 disciples and only two seats? called playing musical chairs right there in case you're wondering what you're playing right so they're all fighting over the chairs and in mark chapter 10 jesus addresses it and jesus starts a discourse with this and he says he that is greatest among you let him become the servant of all oh man you talk about pops and balloons there was a whole lot of popping going on that day and i'll tell you what you know what so many times we get the same way and i want to tell you what prayer is not about us being served. Prayer is about conditioning me and teaching me the power of God so that therefore I can serve other people. Now listen, because the devil is a liar and the father of all lies. That isn't you in your little family circle. That is the world that is lost. That's why Jesus said, go you therefore to your house and witness to your family and have a comfortable marriage and have a good life. I just misquoted scripture really bad, didn't I? Because what did Jesus say? Go you therefore unto all the world. Right? Isn't that what he said? But you know what? In the American Christianity circles, we want to have our family and just have our family together and have everything wonderful and our kids behave and our dog be nice. I have a really jumpy dog right now. He's a puppy, and he's like five months old, and I swear, I, last night, not last night, on, on Friday night, I wanted to kill him. Because I, don't ask me why, but we're ready to go to bed, and he decided it's time to get zoomies and bite everybody and attack everybody and jump on everything, and I'm like, I just really want to kill you right now. And he we came about this close, but he lived, thank God. But how many know that everything isn't always going to be all right? God didn't tell me that my family was just going to be the center of my focus. Come on now, because you know what? We can get caught into that. Well, you know, we're supposed to go see the family. Well, that's why the Bible said, you know, you got to leave and cleave. It's going to get convicting here. Someone needs to hear this. That's why the Bible tells me to leave and cleave, and then Jesus tells me I have to leave and cleave. He says, i got to follow him. He says, he's going to be number one in my life. Matter of fact, the very first commandment God put on the Ten Commandments is what? Don't have any other gods before me. How many know that's really difficult sometimes? Man, I think about that a lot. Well, that's another message some other day. All right, so I want to move on here because I want you to get this. This is the key of this thing. So if I want my prayer life to have answered prayers, I've got to do something. I've got to be positioned in the right spot. Man, God's been dealing with my heart a lot about positioning, to tell us as a church about positioning, because you've got to position your life. Now, how do you do that? You see, your condition determines your position. I want everyone to get that. Your condition determines your position with God. 
How do I get my position better? I change my condition. Now, I want to go to racing because racing is kind of not really something I follow, but it was interesting to me as I pulled this up and I thought about it, and I see something. Way in the back is the last car. Everyone see that car? If you see the one in front of it, it's painted the same colors as that car, so they're a team, right? And I looked at them and I said, why are they way in the back? Well, something's wrong. How many know something's wrong? Because you don't spend money on race cars to be last, do you? Right? Anyone here like racing? Nobody? Oh, I knew there's a few. Right? How many know what do you what do you get a race car for? To lose? To spend money? To crash into the wall? To wreck? No. You do it for what? To win. Why do people put their advertisements on the side of your car? Because you're a winner, right? If you see a race car out there with very little advertisements, he's got issues, right? Because why? He's obviously not very good because no one wants to be his sponsor. It's just that simple. Or her sponsor. We better include everybody there. Their sponsor. How's that? Okay. So I looked at that and I thought about something as I looked at that. I thought, you know what? There's something wrong. Now, that doesn't mean that's the slowest car there. How many know that? It could be the fastest car there, but it has a problem. What's the problem? It could be the driver. How many know you can have a really fast car, but a really bad driver, and your car doesn't go fast? Right? Another thing that I know a little bit about racing is whenever you're racing, you know, according to the conditions, you have to have on the right tires. Right? All these cars are lined up because of the way they qualified. It could have been they have a really bad master chief, or whatever they call him, who sits in there and, and does all the programming of the car. And he might have programmed wrong. But I know something happened because he is in that position because of what? His condition. Now, I want to relate that to your life. You see, God is good. God is the car. He gives you the best car. He gives you the best tires. He gives you the best crew. What comes down to your life is the driver. And who do you think the driver is? We like to blame everybody else for that. Well, if I was just what happened to me, you know, instead I'd be so much better. And God's like, suck it up, buttercup. I'm your salvation. I'm your hope. I'm your joy. Bad, I just wanted to tell you this. Everyone listen real close. Bad things happen to everybody. I want you to know that. It's what we do with the bad things. And by the way, there's a really cool scripture that's in the Word of God that you need to memorize every time. And that's called Romans 8, 28, where it says, all things work together for your good. He didn't say good things work together for your good. He didn't say lots of money works together for your good. He didn't say when you hit the lottery, good things happen to you. He said all things work together for your good. You see, the key is whether or not I'm willing to go through it to get to the good. And you know what most of us do? We get stuck in the bad, and we never get to the good. Because in America today, somebody say amen. Of the America today, we love to get stuck in the bad and tell everyone our bad, sad story. How many in here, don't raise your hand yet, okay? But you ever get around people that every time you go see them, they tell you about all the things that have gone wrong in their life and their sicknesses and all the medications they're on and all that kind of stuff. And every time you go there, it's like, I've heard this story before, but at the end they add one more bad thing that happened to them, right? How many know what I'm doing? How many of you enjoy going to hang out with them? Anybody? A word for you. Don't be that person. Because you know what? We can become the same thing. We can sit there and talk to people, and God's trying to change our situation and change our position, but he can't change our position until we change our condition. And every time God deals with us, we sit there and say, but you don't understand what happened to me, God. You don't understand I was abused. You don't understand, God, I was raped. You don't understand, God, that I went through this. You don't understand that they robbed from me. You don't understand they stole me. And you sit there, and you are the same thing. The person that no one in here wanted to be around, we become that person to God. And we sit there all the time wanting to tell God about all the things and we list them, all the reasons why we can't succeed and become what God wants us to become. And God's sitting there going, ay caramba. Because God says, I have plans for you. I want to use you. I want to take your pain and your suffering. And I, how many know that we're free because of Jesus' pain and suffering? Everyone knows that, right? You don't know, but you've said it. I just want to be like Jesus. <laughs> Don't you wish you would have never said that? But everyone says that. Why? Because we want to be like Jesus. 
Well, how many know that Jesus' whole covenant and his whole story of his life came through pain and suffering? Oh, I want to be like Jesus with, I want to be like after the tomb with Jesus to be like Jesus. Yeah. Resurrection Sunday, come out. Yeah, devil, you're lost. Yeah, we all like that part, but how many know you're going to die before you can get to that point? How many know you're going to be crucified before you get to that point? How many know you're going to be beaten before you get to that point? How many are you going to have nails through your hands before you get to that point? I didn't know that part was wrong. I just thought we were going to talk about the resurrection. You see, prayer is all about me lining up my life with what God wants. And there's times in your life, I want you to listen, that bad things have to happen in your life to give you the testimony of hope to the people who are going through bad things. How many know one of the best lifeguards you could ever get is someone who almost drowned, who makes up their minds that they don't want anyone else ever to drown again, and they go learn how? Why? Because they were there. How many know one of the best witnesses you can ever have is somebody that's been through the storms and been through life and had really bad things happen to them, and you start telling people, and they look at you, huh, you know you're getting good with God. You ready for this? Whenever they'll, you know, I can't believe you went through that. Good. That means I'm not living on that. I'm living on where I am. When I start doing that, I don't know who needs to hear this today, but God has me stuck here. When I start doing that, I start releasing the power of the gospel in my life, and I start living like Jesus, because Jesus, how many know that after the resurrection, he doesn't talk very much about the cross? He doesn't talk about the nails. Oh, he doesn't say, look at the scars, dude. He ain't talking about, he's like, Thomas, you want to feel them? Go ahead, thrust your hand on my side. I'm, I'm not there anymore. I'm gone. I, I'm different now. I'm ran transformed. Yeah, I was there, but I'm here now. I'm the risen Lord. Man, we need to get that in our lives. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but you need to quit talking about all the bad things that happened in your life and start living in the promises of God that like a, like a king set in a tent that he sets the sun and he lets it rise up and go every day. He goes over there because he is consistent. He is trustworthy. He is holy. He is just. His promises will never fade. And he says, I did it with the sun so that you would know I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. My word is my word. My truth is my truth. It doesn't matter how anyone else is. It doesn't matter what comes against you. When I read the Old Testament, Israel had some insurmountable odds in their life. Maybe you haven't done it. I've been enjoying it. I can't say enjoying it. But I've been watching videos on what's happening in the conflict of Israel because we don't report on them a lot. And I'm sitting amazed at how Israel is defending itself over there and how they're just coming through it. And I, you might not know this, but Iran's been a big player behind the whole thing and causing all kind of problems. And uh, every day I get to watch, I watch a certain video that I watch that tells what happened in Israel that night and what happened in Israel that day. And it's like, and they defeated Iran again, and they got these people here, and they found this here, and they destroyed this here, and they were going to try to kill people here, and they stopped it there. And I'm like, man, God, you're cool. Why is that cool to me? Because in the physical, I'm watching a promised people who are in disobedience that God is saving because he made a covenant with them. And I look at that and I say, if God will do that for someone in disobedience who doesn't want to accept Jesus Christ, how much more will God do that with us who believe and trust God, who have been grafted into the vine with them and have the same promises that I'm actively pursuing? Oh, that's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. I don't want to live back there in the tomb no more. I don't want to live back there in the cross no more. I want to live in my future, and I'm tired of sticking in my pain. So he goes on. He says this. All right, ready for this? Here's another scripture, 2 Corinthians 1.20, and you got to get this in your life. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes in Christ. Everyone get that? Right there is a blanket by God moving Paul by the Holy Spirit where he says, every single promise in the Word of God is what? Yes. Everyone. That's awesome. And then he goes on. He says this. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. How many know what amen means? What's it mean? It means so be it. It's done. It's finished. So all the promises of God are yes. And it says there, and so through him, the amen is spoken by who? Who? Yeah, I heard it quoted this way all my life. All the promises of God are yes and amen. That's not what it says. God doesn't say all the promises of God are yes and amen. 
What's God say? All the promises are yes, and you people seal it with the what? Amen, so be it. Now, that doesn't mean amen in my prayer. I don't want you to think that. That's not sealing. What it means is I am the one who seals the promise of God in my life. God doesn't do it. God says, here's the promise. In other words, it's just like you, and you get a letter, and it comes in the mail, and it's certified, and you've got to sign your name on it, and you open it up, and it says, you have this inheritance. Everyone with me? In order to claim this inheritance, please contact Joe Schmo Smock Lawyer at 555-1212, right? And it gives you the phone number. Now, what do I have to do in that moment? I've got to get on the phone, and Joe Schmo Smock says to me, if this is you, oh, you got the letter, I'm going to send it out. You need to make an appointment and come down to my office, and we need to sign papers, and we need to go over the will and tell you what is yours, right? Everyone get this? The same thing is in the Word of God. The Word of God, when you start reading the New Testament from Acts to Revelation, is your will and testament. Everyone get that? It's God, Jesus, saying, this is what I left you. This is what I'm giving you. He has the Old Testament written as an example and saying, this is how it works. It might seem impossible and it might seem like it can't come true, but I'm the supernatural miracle working God. And he says, it doesn't matter. Now, you've got to do something to move yourself into that place, right? I've got to change my condition in order to change my position. And I can sit there and say, well, this can't even be real. I can't believe that they would leave me that. My Uncle Joe would never leave me that. Well, dude, you got the paper. You all getting this? By the way, you all got the paper. It's called the Bible. Everyone understand that? He wrote it. Like, here's your testimony. Here, here's the testament. Here's my last will and testament. This is what I leave behind you. All things will work together for your good. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Here it is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Ask anything in my name and I will do it. He goes on and all these scriptures that are all through the word of God. And he's like, here they are. They're yours. Ask, well, that doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work because I'm not in the right position because I'm in the wrong condition. You see, the Bible tells me a double-minded, a double-minded man will receive nothing from the Lord. What will we receive? What? What's he going to receive? I want you to get that. A double-minded man will receive nothing from the Lord. What's that mean? One day I believe in God, next day I don't. I think God's going to bless me. No, he's not. That's a double-minded man. Like, you can't make up your mind. You're schizo. Or you're psycho. Or you're just a little nutty in the head. But God sits there and says, I'm not doing it. I can't do anything in your life because one day you're here, the next day you're here. You've got to get consistent with God. You've got to change your condition. Didn't God say all things would work together for your good? Then why are you still living in that past and still whining about it and still complaining about it? all the people that hurt me, all the things that went wrong in my life? You don't understand, Pastor Terry. No, I do. I've been there. And I can live in that pain or I can live in the resurrection. Which one do you want to live in? You can't experience the, revelation, the resurrection by staying in the grave when the stone's already been rolled away. Ooh, you ready for this? Some of us like the grave clothes. Some of us like the dark. It's nice being in here. You know, you find a bunch of your sorry friends and you all tell you, this is so bad, I just can't believe how bad it is. Kick them to the curb. Because you know what? They're not a good influence in your life. They want to always remind you about the past. You need to start living in your future. Right? Yeah. All right. So let's move on here. And I'm going to close. Ready? So I like this. Sorry, Dad. There's a story behind this picture. This is it, right? 13-year-old crashes Lamborghini Hurricane during nighttime joyride. How many would want to kill that kid? Well, first of all, you shouldn't own a car like that. You should be giving it to Jesus, okay? So good for you. God took it away from you. That's the first thing you got to learn. All right? Stupid is, stupid does. God would never, God, just every prophetic word, God is not going to give you a Lamborghini unless he wants to sell it and give it to the kingdom of God. All right? I'm just telling you. So I wish I had. God's like, come on now. All right? This is what I have here. If I want to change my position, ready for this? I need to change my condition. Why'd that car wreck? Is it the car's fault? Is it the dad's fault? Don't know. But I knew whose fault it was. Whose fault was it? 
a 13-year-old kid who got behind the wheel of a car that he shouldn't have been driving yet because he's three years from legal. And I don't care who you are, if you give a 16-year-old a Lamborghini, you're stupid. I'm just telling you straight up. You give a 19-year-old a Lamborghini, I think you're still stupid. I'm not too sure about even giving a 25-year-old a Lamborghini. You're still kind of stupid. What are Lamborghinis for? Old men who have a lot of money who don't drive fast no more. <laughs> That's what they're made for. They got the potential, but they can't make it do it no more. That's what it's all about, right? It's called eye candy. Because how many know if you had a Lamborghini in Pennsylvania, you'd have, by the time you got to Indiana, it'd be like 90% of it would be back there in the highway somewhere. I'm just telling you. I'd much rather have a four-wheel drive truck than my Lamborghini going out there to Indiana. Everyone know what I'm talking about? I guarantee you'd leave the hole underneath when you hit the first railroad track. I guarantee you when you went 422 to hit Indiana, you'd lose the rest of the car in the second railroad track. And you'd be sitting there in the seat with the steering wheel wondering what happened. Stupid is, stupid does. But seriously, in order to change things, you've got to make better choices. And I want to leave that with you this morning. My wife's awesome. Don't tell her I said that. She's sitting back there. She, she heard it, so I have to tell her why. She puts up with people way more than I do. If you want someone to pet your head, call my wife. If you want someone to kick you in the butt to get you motivated, call me. Because I'm the kicker and she's the petter. I'm just telling you straight up. But you know what? God put us together for a purpose and a reason because sometimes you need petted, but most of the time we need kicked. That's just my theory. <laughs> I have an amen for that. I have a lot of people I'd like to kick, but I can't kick them, bless God. No, seriously. Change your choices. If you're waiting for God to do a miracle in your life, he already did. I want to say that again. In closing, if you're waiting for God to do a miracle in your life, he already did. It was 2,000 years ago when he came out of a grave. It was 2,000 years ago when he saw Peter, James, John, and all those people. It was 2,000 years ago when he said, it's needful for me to go away. You don't know how many times I wish I could sit down and have a conversation with Jesus, Shannon. And I'd like to talk to him, but he said, that's not how this works. It was 2,000 years ago when he ascended to the right hand of the Father and put his blood upon the Ark of the Covenant and said, it is finished and sat down and ever lives to make intercession for the saints. It was 2,000 years ago when he released the Holy Spirit to come down and fill man. So the first, again, one more time in the first, in what? Four or 5,000 years for the first time we could have the Spirit and the breath of God re-enter us that was removed through sin. Man. I get goosebumps when I say that stuff. That's just so cool. It makes my hair stand up in my hair. Whenever I realize that I got the breath of God redeposited inside of me, that I, what was removed by sin is now put back in me. And anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord can be saved and Shannon have that breath put back in him again and walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. And that's so awesome and so cool. But what do you have to do to get there? You've got to get out of the grave. You've got to change your condition. God's not going to do a miracle in your life and miraculously move you from where you are. God has you where you are to teach you a lesson and to learn you a lesson and show you what victory really looks like. Listen to what I'm going to say. For you and your life. You can sit there and I could share my testimony and say, wow, that's what I wish I was there. I wasn't there all the time. I had to get there. And you're going to have to get there. And someday people will look at your life if you choose. Everyone say, if you choose. Because God has done everything you need. That's why when you read the last book, that's why Jesus said, ready for this? It is finished. Three words. Now it wasn't all sealed, it wasn't all done yet, but he knew it was. Because the devil screwed up. And ever since that day, it has been finished. And by the way, your victory is finished too. Your promise is finished now, but you've got to change your choices. And change your position and change your life and your confession so my position changes. We just, nope, don't stand with me. Because you know what we're going to do? We're going to celebrate the covenant of Jesus Christ. So give me some people to get up with communion. Come on, Nick, come right up here. Yeah, oh, Sarah, you can come with him too because he needs to move.
I need three. I need more. I need more. Shannon, grab some. I need another. I think I got one, two, three, four, or five plates. Come on, Mike, grab one. And we're going to do communion because you know what communion represents? It's finished. And we're going to celebrate it's finished. Now listen, I don't know where you're at, and I know it takes time. It's a process. And by the way, I wish it could be miraculous. Thanks. I wish it could be instant. That I could say that God's just going to show up. I wish I could say that, you know, one day I was walking with God and all of a sudden God just changed everything in my life and everything got better. It didn't work that way. It was little changes at a time in my life. There was a day and an age in my life where I curled up on a chair and I was depressed and I'd been there. And my counselor said, you ought to go on medication. And I said, no, I shouldn't go on medication. And I'm not here to judge anybody. I just knew one thing. When you go on medication, it's hard to get off medication. And I made up my mind, I'll get through this. How am I going to get through it? I don't know, but God is faithful. How many know what I'm talking about? I was there. I lived it. For three months, I lived on my little chair. I curled up in that chair. Every day. And I'd sit there and think about all the things that went wrong. Because I was in a mess. But isn't God awesome? Because that was then, this is now. And it's all because of this covenant. Remember what Jesus said? Don't forget these three words. It is what? Finished. And you know what? He wasn't just speaking it at the cross. He was speaking it to every single person in this room. He said, when I enter your life, it is finished. I'm going to do things that are supernatural. I'm going to do things that are crazy. I'm going to be the power. I'm going to be the life. I'm going to change your destiny. I'm going to change your position, but you've got to be willing to do it by changing your condition. Now, I want to ask you this morning, as we go to do this Lord's Supper, I want to ask you, what's your condition like? Just look back at this week. How much whining did you do? How much complaining did you do? How much serving yourself did you do? How much making it about you and yours did you do? Or were you God-minded? And were you sitting there and praying, Lord, I want more so that I can change more people's lives and touch more people's lives. Or was your prayer, Lord, would you let my family and me be better so that we can have a more comfortable life? I challenge you this week. Look at your prayer life. I challenge you to look back at your prayer life. What have you been praying? What have you been asking God for? You've been asking God to be a world changer or you've been asking God to be world comfortable? Lord, what are we going to do if Kamala Harris wins? What are we going to do if Donald Trump wins? We're going to do whatever every time we do everything. We're going to live our lives. And I don't know about you. On November, December, January of next year, what am I going to do? I'm going to keep following Jesus. I mean that seriously. Because what I have is God's. I'm only temporary here. Some things need to get that into your heads. Don't get sucked into this whole thing. Trump's my savior, or Kamala Harris is my savior, or whoever's your savior. Because you know what? They're not, they're people. This is my savior. The one who left me a covenant. You know what he told me, Garrett? Do this till I come. You know there's a day I'm never going to do this again. You all know that? It's true to God. There's going to be a day that we're never going to have communion ever again. But you know what? There's a day I'm going to sit down at what's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I have no clue what that looks like. I don't know where it's going to be. I don't know what the table is going to look like. I don't know any of that stuff. But I know it is going to be crazy. How do you know? Because I'm going to be dancing on the table. And there's a lot of other people. Because it's going to be a celebration like we've never had before. And on that day, Jesus is going to look at us, Garrett. And you know what he's going to say one more time? It is finished. Man, isn't that awesome? He's going to say, it's done, guys. It's over. That's it. I'm God. Now I'm going to show the whole world I'm God. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. 
That's crazy. Man, I got goosebumps on my goosebumps. They're kissing each other right now. So crazy. But until then, this is what I have. Father, I thank you. I praise you for every person in this room. God, I thank you for this covenant that you gave me right here. To know God, it is finished. But God, until the day that we sit at that supper with you, God, I'm going to do this in memory of you. And God, one more time, no matter where I'm at in my life, no matter where these people are in their lives, God, we've got this covenant that we hold in our hands that you said to do in remembrance of you, that God, it is finished. I thank you, God, that everything I need has been paid for through the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, that everything I have is paid for by the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. That God, through this covenant, oh, it's the most awesome covenant in this world, and I praise you for this time to celebrate it. And Jesus was sitting with his disciples, and he took bread, and he held it in his hand, and he broke it, and I want you to break it. And he said, this is my body. My body. He said, take it and eat. Take it and eat. Hmm. And after all the moisture disappeared from their mouths, from eating the bread, which was that saltine cracker that I just ate, God said, you know what? If you just stick to the body, it's not enough. He said, you need something to wash it down with. And he said, it's the blood. It's the life of God. Do you realize blood is life-giving? You know that man can't recreate blood. You know it's divine. Every creature that has it, you take away the blood, it dies. It's so cool. And God said, this is the life. And by the way, this is a representation of the Holy Spirit because he's the life. That's why you meet some people and they're like choky Christians because they got the saltine in their mouth, but they never got the blood. They never got the power of God in their lives. But we're going to take it. And he said, this is the covenant. And this represents my blood. Take it and drink. Now listen. I don't know where your walk with God is. But I know one thing. God doesn't like me more than he likes you. And if God could bring me through the crap that I've gone through and the storms that I've gone through and the messes that I've gone through and a lot of the other people sitting around you have been through the same thing and they can come out the other side. And that doesn't mean their life's perfect. I mean, after all, I'm still married to Bethany. But God's still good. And I still have the victory. I love you, honey. She laughs. She knows I'm kidding. Some of you get offended. She just laughs. God's awesome, and God wants to bring you through this. Would you just bow your head right now? Just feel the need to do this. If you're sitting here and you're saying, Pastor Terry, thanks for the message. I need to pray for this morning that I move out of this stupid place I'm in. Would you raise your hand and say, pray for me? I see hands all over this church. Pray for me, because it's time for me to get out of this dumb place I'm in. Raise your hand. We're going to pray. Put your hands down. I want you to take your hand and put it in the person beside you or someone around you. Find someone to lay a hand on with them. Because I don't, you don't need to know who raised their hand, but we're going to pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus over every hand that was lifted and every person who didn't have the courage to raise their hand. That God, this morning, they would grab this covenant that you gave us, the blood and the body of Jesus Christ, where you said it is finished. God, in heavenly places right now, their story is finished. And God, you sealed it, and no man, no person, no event, no evil, no demon, no devil, no power, no principality, no spiritual wickedness, no ruler of darkness can rewrite your words. If they will position themselves by changing their condition, God, you will give them victory. I pray, God, that they'll have the strength to stand up and say, that's it. It is finished. I'm not living in that past anymore. I'm not living in that garbage anymore. God, you said I do a new thing and I claim it. I accept the resurrection. I walk out of this tomb. I'm not staying here anymore. I'm going to be what God wants me to be in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, I trust you. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for the rising of the sun 
and the setting of the same. And God, I claim it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. We seal it with that covenant. They're going to sing a song and you're dismissed. Hey, we're going to tear out carpet over here because they're putting in new carpet in the kids' church this week. So if you can help, hang out. If not, Jesus loves you and thinks you're amazing. So here's where we're at. The carpet's almost booed up, so I need some strong young men. 
old men, whatever, to carry the carpet into the new room and get the rest of the carpet out because we're about halfway done with the kids doing it. So that's a good thing. So if you just spend some time, go over there and help pull up carpet, that'd be great. Hey, Jesus loves you. Thanks, your mate.